Today, I'm going to teach you a very special game. This game has quickly become one of my favorite solo board games of all time. It is none other than Too Many Bones, a dice rolling RPG game. This is an incredible game. It single-handedly rekindled my forgotten love for dice rolling. If you think you don't like dice rolling, let go of the bias and please give this a try. I was hesitant to purchase this game as I'm the type of gamer that prefers certainty and complete information, but I'm so glad that I gave this game a try. This box comes with a lot of surprises and excitement. Let's learn how to play the solo variant of Too Many Bones. In Too Many Bones, you become a gearlock and go on an adventure to defeat a tyrant. Throughout this video, we will use Picket as the chosen gearlock and Molmish as the tyrant. Each gearlock comes with a gearlock mat, a gearlock reference sheet, a set of a gearlock dice, which includes the skill dice over here, the stat dice over here, and the initiative die, and then it comes with a gearlock chip. Throughout the adventure, you will upgrade your Gearlock's stats and skills. Through upgrading, Gearlock will become stronger, that is, they get more health, deal more damage, defend more damage, and also learn new skills. Your adventure will progress in days where during each day you will face a new encounter. There is only one way to win, and it's twofold. First, you must face various encounters each day and accumulate progress points over here in order to face the tyrant. Second, once you have accumulated sufficient progress points, you must face the tyrant and defeat it by bringing its health points down to zero. The number of progress points you need to collect before facing the tyrant is indicated on the middle right portion of the tyrant card. For example, to face Molmish, you need 6 progress points or more. Once you're facing Molmish, you will win the game if you defeat him by bringing his hit points down to zero. The tyrant's hit point values are indicated on the top left corner of the tyrant chip, so for Molmish, it would be 8. On the other hand, you will lose if you do not defeat the Tyrant within a certain number of days that is indicated on the Tyrant card. The maximum number of days you can spend to defeat the Tyrant is indicated on the middle right portion of the Tyrant card. So if you end your ninth day without defeating Molmish, you'll lose the game. In essence, the game is a race against the clock. Will you be able to accumulate enough progress points and defeat the tyrant within a certain amount of days? If so, you will win. If not, you will run out of time and lose. I'll show you how to set up the game board. First, place the battle mat near you. Then select a tyrant. The tyrant comes with a tyrant card, a tyrant chip, a tyrant encounter card, and a tyrant die. You want to leave them on the side of the battle mat for now. Of course, we will be using Momish in this setup video. Next, place the day counter card and the day counter chip near you and set it to one. I prefer using dice instead of the day counter, but this is simply a matter of preference. Then create the encounter deck. The encounter deck must be tailored to the tyrant that you're facing. The encounter deck consists of three special encounters numbered 1 to 3. 1, 2, 3. Plus the number of solo encounter cards equal to the number of days shown on the tyrant card minus 3. So this would be 9 minus 3, which is 6. So I would have to get one, two, three, four, five, six solo encounter cards. And finally, you will include the Tyrant encounter card. In terms of order, the first three special encounter cards 
are always sequentially placed on top of the encounter deck and the rest of the encounter cards are shuffled below. So I'll have to shuffle the rest of the encounters. And these will be at the bottom. And the first three special encounter cards, one, two, three, will sequentially be placed on top like this. This would be your encounter deck. Next, create a loot deck and a trove loot deck near you. Place the four lock picking dice near the trove loot deck as well. Then create the baddie active stacks. On the bottom of the tyrant card, there are different symbols that indicate which creature types must be included in the adventure as baddies. So if you're playing against Mulmish, you need to pick up all the beasts, bogs, and scale chips. So I've assembled all the one point baddies, five point baddies, and 20 point baddies according to their type. So one point baddies of scales, bogs, and beasts, and five point baddies of scales, bogs, beasts, and 20 point baddies of scales, bogs, and beast. Flip all the baddie chips face down and shuffle them and create separate one point, five point, and 20 point baddie active stacks. If you run out of any baddies in the active stack, reshuffle the defeated baddies to replenish the active stack. Next, choose a gear lock. Each gear lock comes with a gear lock mat, a gear lock chip, a gear lock initiative die, their skill dice, their stat dice, and their reference sheet. Place all of this nearby you as well. Next, make a pool of defense dice, attack dice, status effect dice, initiative dice for lanes, round marker dice, d6 dice, and a couple of other d6 dice as well for your own preference. And also have the lane marker chips ready as well. I will show you how the board looks on a bird eye perspective. This is the bird eye view. The one thing I didn't explain is the dice tray that I use over here. Having a dice tray makes the dice rolling experience a lot more enjoyable. So I like to set up one right beside my character mat. Too Many Bones is played over a series of days. Each day contains four phases. The new day phase, the new encounter phase, the reward phase, and the recovery phase. To summarize briefly, during the new day phase, you move to the next day. And during the new encounter phase, you face an encounter that may involve fighting some enemies. If you successfully complete the encounter, then you move to the reward phase where you reap the rewards associated with the encounter and then move to the recovery phase. However, if you do not successfully complete it, then you skip the reward phase and go straight to the recovery phase. The recovery phase is the last phase of the day where you can heal your wounded gear lock, open some interesting loot, or have a quick peek of the next enemy you may face. The game starts off on the new day phase, which is always day one. To keep track of the day that you're on, you use the day chip and the day counter card. However, I like to use the d6 die to keep track of my days. And if I am on day seven, for example, I would just bring another one and do something like this. The second phase is the encounter phase. During the encounter phase, you must draw and reveal an encounter card from the encounter deck. The front face of the encounter card presents the situation of the encounter. The back face of the encounter card will explain what you need to do for the encounter. The encounter card may require you to choose from two or more options. It also explains what the effects and also what the consequences are for each of the options. There are two types of encounters. There are peaceful encounters and there are 
battle encounters. Peaceful encounters are indicated with this symbol on the far right side of this encounter choice. And if you choose this peaceful encounter, you will automatically succeed the encounter without the need to engage in fights. You simply need to follow the instructions on the encounter choice and move to the reward phase. For example, let's assume that you're on day one and you drew the special encounter card called Leaving Obender. You read the front side, which gives you some flavor text, and when you flip it, you realize that you have two choices, and both of them are peaceful encounters. Because both are peaceful encounters, all you need to do is choose one of the options and move on to the reward phase. Battle encounters are different. They are indicated with this far right symbol over here, and if you choose a battle encounter, you have to engage in a fight. For example, let's assume you're on day two and you drew the special encounter card hardly out the gate. You read the front text, which gives you some context, and you flip over the encounter card and you realize that you have two battle encounters. Both are battle encounters, therefore you must engage in a battle this encounter. To understand how battles work, you must know what the battle mat is and how your gear lock works. First, let's look at the battle mat and your gear lock chip. The gear lock chip represents you as the gear lock during battle. The chip is double sided. You'll notice that the back side has stars around the portrait. During the start of the game, you start with the side without the stars. The gear lock chip goes on the battle mat, and battle mat is where all the action happens. You and your enemies will run around the battle mat and fight until only one side remains. Your goal is to remain on the battle mat without getting knocked out by enemies. We will discuss more about the mat in detail later. Let's turn to the gear lock mat. All gear locks have four basic stats, health, dexterity, attack, and defense. Each stat has a starting stat, which is printed on the gear lock mat. For example, Picket has five health, two dexterity, one attack, and two defense. Health represents the maximum health Picket starts with. Picket will thus start with five health. For each health, you must place a red health chip underneath Pickett's chip. When Pickett loses health, you must take away the red health chips. So for example, if he takes one damage, you take off one health chip. If you lose the last health chip, then you get knocked out, meaning that you essentially lose the battle. Note that in a multiplayer gear lock game, even if one gear lock is knocked out, they can still succeed the encounter if the remaining gear lock defeats all the enemies. Dexterity represents the maximum number of dice you can roll, as well as the maximum amount of movement you can take during a turn. In Too Many Bones, you have a lot of dice that can aid you in the battle. They can do damage, they can also prevent damage, and you can perform interesting skills. Each die costs one dexterity to roll, and each movement also costs one dexterity. In Too Many Bones, you can move in an orthogonal movement for one dexterity. For example, Pickett starts with two dexterity. This means that he can roll two dice, whether they are attack, defense or skill die roll one die and move two space uh, move one space or simply move two spaces attack represents the amount of attack dice you have at your disposal during a turn in other words you can choose to roll as many attack dice as you want up to the amount of your attack value as long as you have sufficient dexterity each attack die costs one dexterity to roll. For example, Pickett starts with one attack and two dexterity. 
So during his turn, you can roll up to a maximum of one attack die and take one additional action that requires one dexterity, such as moving one space or rolling some other die like a defense die. Rolling attack dice allows you to deal damage to your target. As you can see here, this is an attack die. It has four sides that has a value of one attack and one side with a value of two and another side with bones. For example, let's say you roll the attack die and okay, so you landed on two. It means that you can deal two damage to your enemy. Defense represents the amount of defense dice you have at your disposal during a turn. Similar to the attack dice, you can choose to roll as many defense dice you want up to the amount of your defense value as long as you have sufficient dexterity at your disposal. Each defense die costs one dexterity to roll. So for example, Pickett starts with two defense and two dexterity. So during your turn, you can roll up to a maximum of two defense or roll one defense and roll something else such as an attack die. Rolling defense dice allows you to place defense dice on your active slots. Your active slots are over here. So let's say if you rolled two defense, then you can place two defense dice on your active slots like so. When you have defense dice on your active slots, you may use them to prevent the same number of damage. Of course, if you use your defense die to prevent damage, then you must decrease your defense die by the same amount. So for example, if you want to prevent one damage, you'd have to get rid of one. One very important rule about defense dice in the active slots is that the total number of defense dice currently in the active slots will reduce the available defense dice you can roll for the turn. For example, let's say that you have one defense die on your active slot and you have total of two defense. In this case, you can only roll one defense die because you already have one defense die in the active slot. We now know that the attack die does damage and the defense die that prevents damage. What would happen if you rolled bones instead? Attack and defense dice all have bones sides. An attack die has one bone side, a defense die has two bones sides. When you roll a bone, you can choose to activate special backup plan abilities. You can think of these abilities as special skills that are unique to each gear lock. If you roll bones, you can choose to place them on your backup plan slots like this. Pickett has five backup plans and starting from two bones, you can do some sort of ability. For example, if you use two bones, then you can do shield bash which deals X number of damage to the target where X equals all the defense you rolled plus all the defense dice on your active slots and your locked slots. You can only use one backup plan per turn. There is a detailed information of these backup plan abilities in Pickett's reference sheet. Throughout gameplay, you can learn new skills by spending training points. Skills are generally one-time use abilities that are powerful. But unlike attack dice and defense dice, most skills are one-time use abilities. Let's pretend that I have learned this skill over here. Once you use this skill by rolling it, and if you use it, then that you must place them in the exhausted dice area over here. Exhausted dice cannot be used during the battle again. After the battle, all exhausted dice can be used again in the next battle. To roll a skill that you've learned, 
you have to spend one dexterity just like attack and defense dice. For more information about each skills, you can refer to Pickett's reference sheet. There are two attack forms, melee and ranged. Pickett is obviously melee, but Boomer, for example, is a ranged gearlock. These forms determine how your gearlock can target and attack other enemies. Melee gearlocks can target adjacent units, meaning they must be orthogonally next to each other, while ranged gear locks can target any unit on the map. Your attack also determines where you start the battle on the battle mat. For example, Pickett is a melee character, so at the start of the battle, he must start at one of these positions, these four over here. He cannot start anywhere else. If Pickett wants to attack an enemy, he must be adjacent to that enemy orthogonally, like this. Adjacent means orthogonal in too many bones. For example, Pickett would be able to target this one and also this one, but he couldn't, cannot target this one. Each gear lock has unique innate abilities. You can think of innate abilities as special skills that you start with at the beginning at your disposal. For example, Pickett's innate ability is Shield Wall. This allows Pickett to roll all of his defense die at the beginning of the battle. And he can place rolled defense to his active slots, like this. Any bones rolled cannot be placed on the backup bone backup plan, so Pickett has an additional benefit for upgrading his defense stat ability due to this innate ability. Gearlocks can improve their innate abilities. To do this, you need to spend six bones. So let's say that you had six bones like this already. And then during your turn, let's say you rolled, and then let's say this rolled a bone. Then you can use all of these six bones in order to improve your innate ability to innate plus one. And once you do this, you will flip over your gear lock chip to the star side. For Pickett, in addition to his shield wall innate ability, his gear lock innate plus one ability allows him to place rolled defense die to his locked slots. This is beneficial as locked defense dice do not reduce the available defense dice, and also any dice in the locked slots can carry over from battle to battle. Whereas for active slots, after the battle, all your unused dice in the active slots are removed. The innate plus one ability is a permanent effect that carries on for the rest of the game. And that is, you can start with innate plus one during your future battles. Now that you know how gear locks work, let's look at how enemies work to fully understand the battle system. Enemies in Too Many Bones are called baddies. There are three types of baddies. One point baddies, five point baddies, and 20 point baddies. The baddies with higher points are generally stronger than the ones with lower points. During the battle encounter, baddies will appear on the opposite side of the battle mat on these lanes over here. Baddies will take turns and during their turns, they will attack gear locks and perform skills if any. Let's assume that there is a one point baddie and this is a troll youngin um, on the field. The side with the baddie image indicates how strong the baddie is, and let's look at it in more detail. The top corner indicates the health of the baddie. The troll young'un has a health value of four. 
It means that it will come with four health chips. If you can reduce the health chips down to zero, then this baddie will essentially die. The top right corner indicates its attack value and the value be below it indicates its defense value. It means that during its turn, it will roll one attack die and one defense die, and it'll deal damage and prevent future damage. When you roll the defense die, let's say that you rolled and you have one defense value, you place it on top like this to indicate that on the next incoming damage, he can prevent one damage. Below the image, it says a careless and a bones. This indicates the skill of the baddie. This baddie has a skill called careless and it will trigger whenever he rolls a bone. Careless means that the unit takes X number of true damage. So for example, if let's say the troll Youngin rolled and he rolled two bones, then he would essentially deal two damage to himself. All baddies skills are in the Gearlock Adventure Reference Guide. Some skills may have the effect of putting a status die on the target. For example, the Bog Frog has a skill called Poison 2. When the Bog Frog targets a unit, the unit must place a status die on the unit's chip on, and it must have the Poison 2 side up. This indicates that the unit is poisoned by 2. During the start of the next turn, the unit will take 2 poison damage, which will essentially mean that it must lose 2 health chips. And after doing that, this gets reduced to poison 1. And during the turn after that, this unit will take 1 poison damage, and this can now be removed. The icon on the left bottom corner of the chip indicates the attack type. The two swords icon means that this baddie is a melee character. Recall that melee characters can only target adjacent units. If you see a bow mark instead, for example, something like this, this indicates that the unit is ranged. And recall that ranged characters can target anyone on the battle mat. The image next to the attack type indicates the baddie's target priority. And this image with the person with their arms down means that it'll attack the target with the lowest health. For example, let's say that there are two adjacent targets. The baddie will target the gearlock with the lowest health. In this example, Patches has 2 health, whereas Picket has 5 health. So because Patches is the weakest target, the Troll Youngin will target a Patches. The icon next to the priority is the type of monster. This symbol indicates that it's a Troll unit. This value below the health point value is called the initiative. This will be discussed later in the video. Finally, all melee baddies can move twice before rolling, whereas ranged baddies will not move at all. When the melee baddies do move, they must be moved in a way towards the closest target. If there is a tie, then it moves towards the gear lock that fits its target priority. Let's put this into action now. Let's say that it's the baddie's turn and it is standing over here, whereas Picket is standing over here. Baddie will first move two spots. So he can move like this next to Picket, or you can, you can move him like this, or you can also move him like this. It's up to you. Then it will target Picket and throw its attack and defense die. In this case, it'll deal one damage to Picket, like this, and this defense die will go on top like this. 
And now let's say that it's Pickett's turn. And let's say Pickett wants to roll two attack dice because he has two attack and two, def two dexterity. And he rolled two attack. In this case, the troll youngin will prevent one damage, but will take one damage. Like that. Now that you understand how the battle system works, I will explain how you determine how many and which enemies you face during a battle encounter. At the start of a battle, you must create a battle queue, which contains the baddies you will fight for the battle. The first step to creating a battle queue is by referring to the encounter card. It will tell you what the battle queue is. Let's say that you choose the second option and it says BQ batty points. So generally speaking, the battle queue will be batty points. Here is how you calculate batty points. Batty points will equal to the current day times the number of gear locks. Since this is a solo game, your batty points will equal to the number of days you are on. In this case, you must draw baddies equal to the baddie points using highest point baddies whenever possible. So for example, if your baddie points is 6, then you must draw one 5 point baddie and one 1 point baddies. These baddies will be the battle queue in the order from the highest to the lowest. So it'll be like this. This will be your battle queue, and you must draw the baddies that you fight from this stack. In this example, you will have to face two baddies for the battle. That is one five-point baddie and one one-point baddie. The first baddie in this battle queue goes on a lane one. This is a ranged one, so it goes here. And the second one goes on lane two. And this is a melee one, so it goes here. In this situation, since there are only two baddies in the baddie stack, there will be no more baddies. However, if there were more baddies in the baddie stack, you will put up to a maximum of four baddies on the battle mat. If you have more than four baddies and there's one left over in the baddie queue, then this baddie will remain in the battle queue until one of them is defeated. For each baddie on the battle queue, it will occupy the numbered lane as well as a corresponding lane marker chip. So the first baddie will take lane number chip one, and number two will take two. If it's a melee baddie like this frog, then it'll go onto the melee spot. And if it's a ranged baddie like this one, then it'll go onto the ranged spot. And then the relevant health chips will go on the very bottom like this. You might be wondering, well then, what is the turn order? Well, the battle proceeds in rounds. A battle begins with round one. The round number is indicated by the round counter die. At the start of each round, the round counter is increased by one. Each unit takes one turn every round. The initiative meter over here on the battle mat, as well as the initiative die here, these things will determine whose turn it is on the round. At the start of the battle, you must set the initiative dice on the initiative meter. The higher the initiative, the earlier the unit's turn will be. Batty's initiative values is indicated on the chips. It's indicated below the health value over here. So this one, the Goblin Alarmist, will have an initiative value of 6, which is indicated with this six number over here. And this is the lane marker, right? Number one, he's number one. 
and the bog frog has an initiative value of two and this die will also be number two since his lane mark is number two once this is determined you place it based on the order like this gear locks also have initiative values as well to determine the gear locks initiative value unlike baddies you roll the gear locks initiative die so i got a bad roll here and it's i got two initiative which means that i'm i go the very last so i usually like to place all this down here and then as i proceed in the round once this this one goes i just put it up there then so on like this let's say that instead of a two i rolled a three in this case there's a tie between the bog frog and picket in such a tie gear locks will always go first so the turn order will be the goblin alarmist picket and then bog frog after everyone has gone the round token goes into round two and you will notice that um, there are only up to five rounds and after that you must go into a fatigue round at the beginning of a fatigue round all remaining units take one unavoidable damage As discussed earlier, let's assume that there are four baddies on the battle mat and there is one baddie in the battle queue. This remaining baddie will remain in the baddie stack until one of the baddies on the battle mat is eliminated. When a baddie is eliminated, for example, let's say this one was eliminated, at the end of the round, so this one, let's say round two, the first baddie on the battle queue, which is the troll youngin, will take the third lane and regardless of the troll youngin's initiative value, he will always go last. Now that you understand the battle basics, let's go through the battle setup. First, you must trigger any before battle effects and skills, if any, such as Tantrum's innate ability. In this situation, we don't have any before battle effects, so we move to the second phase. Second, you must follow the instructions on the encounter card to build the battle queue. So for this example, let's say you're on day two, and you choose this second option, which states that your baddie queue is equal to your baddie points. So since you're on day two, the battle queue is two. Since your battle queue is equal to two baddie points, you would draw two one point baddies from your active stack and form a battle queue. Third, you place the top baddie from the battle queue to the appropriate lane. In this example, your first one point baddie will occupy lane number one, and second one will occupy lane number two. So the first one goes on top of the first lane marker chip, and second one goes on the second lane marker chip. And now you set their health values and their initiative values. So they both have a health value of four. So they both get four health chips. And you can see that both of them have three initiative values. So this is how you would set up. And also you will notice that both of them are melee baddies so they take the melee position over here the next thing you would do is to roll your initiative die 
So I rolled a three. Since I'm a gear lock, I would take precedence. Next, I would have to place my gear lock onto the battle mat. And since I'm a melee gear lock, I could choose any of these places. Finally, you trigger the start of battle effects such as Pickett's innate shield wall ability which allows Pickett to roll his defense dice at the start of the game. So this one would go over here. Let's look at the gear lock turn sequence. During your turn, you can do the following in order. The first thing you need to do is to check whether you have any start of your turn effects, such as the poison dice we discussed before. So let's say that picket was poisoned, then you check whether you need to apply this poison at the start of your turn. Then second, you may decide to spend X number of dexterity to move X number of adjacent spots. Let's assume that Pickett has two dexterity, then he can move up to two spots like this or like this. Then that would use up all his dexterity points for the turn. Third, you must determine a target for your attack dice, skill dice, and or backup plan abilities if you're planning on using them. So, for example, if Pickett, let's say, has not moved, thus he preserved his two dexterity points, he may choose to roll attack die against Bog Frog. Then you must select the dice you're going to roll for this turn up to the amount of dexterity you have available. So in this situation, Pickett has two decks available and let's say he chooses to roll an attack die and a defense die. Next, you must roll your dice and resolve the rolls. So in this case, Pickett would deal one damage to the bullfrog and one defense to his active slot. This marks the end of your turn and the next one on the list here would go. So let's recap the encounter phase where a battle encounter is involved. So let's assume that you're on day two and you draw the special encounter hardly out the gate. After reading the front text and the second text over here in the back, you choose to do the second option here, which involves a battle encounter. The text states that the battle queue is equal to the baddie points. Since your baddie points is two, you draw two one point baddies from the active stack. Then you place the baddies from the battle queue to the battle map. You check the attack type of both baddies. Both are melee, so they go here, and each of them takes their relevant lane marker chips, as well as their health chips. And they get their initiative values on the initiative meter. Next, you need to determine your initiative value as well. So you roll your own initiative meter. You roll the three, which means that you go above these two baddies. And now it's your turn to go onto the battle mat. So let's say I want to go right over here because he's a melee gear lock. So he needs to go anywhere on these four circles here. In this case, you need to trigger your start of battle effects. So Pickett has an innate ability called shield wall. So we're gonna do this. He rolled two defense, so he these two go on to his active slot right here. If this was the real game, I would actually have additional stat points here or additional skills that I would have learned uh, by virtue of completing day one. Right now, I'm on day two without any 
additional points here. So I'm quite weak to face these two one-point baddies. But for the sake of explanation, I will proceed with one round. As the battle begins, you look at who is at the top of the initiative meter. And that's me. So this unit would go first. I have a value of two dexterity and one attack and two defense. So because I have two defense dice already on my active slots, I cannot roll any defense dice without removing one or two of these. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to move. I'm just going to utilize two dexterity on rolls. So I will take out one defense die here and use one attack die. So let's roll. And of course, my only target here is the bog frog. So I'll target the bog frog. And I rolled one bone and one attack. And thus, this bog frog takes one damage. Now that my turn is finished, it's the bog frog's turn. Notice that the bog frog does not have any attack or defense values. He simply has a poison 2 skill, which means that he would apply poison 2 to his target. And I would do it like this. And the bog frog would have finished his turn. And now it's the troll youngin's turn. He would first start by moving to a maximum of of two spots to the nearest target so he would go down here and he would target picket and he has one attack and one defense so i'm going to roll those two right here and he rolled one defense so that goes over here and he rolled two attack which means picket would be able to prevent one damage but will take one damage This would end round one, and now we would move on to round two. And if Pickett were to go, since he's on the top of the initiative meter, he would first have to resolve the poison status effect. So decrease it, decrease it by one, and or by one, yep, yeah, and then take two damage. So as you can see, this is not going very well, and Mainly, the reason for that is because we moved on to day two without actually resolving day one, which usually results in more stats. So it's not as grim as this. Let's assume that you've proceeded to the battle and you're on round five uh, and you took out all the baddies. In this case, you would have won the battle. So you move on to the reward phase since you succeeded in the encounter. As you can see here on the adventure routine, when you do a new encounter and you succeed, then you move to the reward phase. But if you don't succeed, you move to the recovery phase. During the reward phase, you take the rewards that you've earned from the encounter. Rewards are indicated on the bottom of the encounter card over here, as well as on the far right corner of each encounter choice. The reward choice next to the individual encounter choice applies only if you've chosen that option and succeeded it. For example, if you chose the second battle encounter option and you succeeded, then you would get one progress point, one training point, you would get one loot, as well as one additional training point. Progress points are important because you need to collect a sufficient amount of them in order to face the tyrant. Each tyrant has a specific number of progress points that are required for you to face them.
The number of progress points needed to face the tyrant is indicated on the middle right portion of the tyrant card. For Molmish, you need to collect 6 progress points in order to face him. Once you have collected 6 or more progress points, during the encounter phase, instead of drawing a new encounter card from the encounter deck, you may choose to fight the tyrant instead. Progress point rewards are indicated with this symbol and this number inside of the symbol. So if I were to successfully complete this encounter, I would get one additional progress point. What I like to do is somewhere on the game board, I would place a D6 die like this to indicate the number of progress points that I've earned. Training points can be used to upgrade your gearlock stats or learn a new skill. One training point will get you one training attempt for any one stat or one new skill. And the training points are indicated with this symbol right here. So if I were to complete this second choice of the battle encounter, I would earn two training points in addition to other rewards. For stats, if your training attempt is successful, you may increase the value of that stat by one by using the stat die. For health, all training attempts will be successful. In other words, with one training point, you may gain one additional health all the time. The same applies for dexterity. Your dexterity training attempts will always be successful, so if you choose to up your dexterity, then you will always get plus one. For attack and defense, however, different rules apply. In order to succeed in your attack training attempt, you must roll a number of attack dice that is equal to your current attack value. If you roll any bones during the attempt, you will fail the training attempt. Thus, you will have to spend the training point elsewhere. It's important to note that the failed training attempt will not result in you losing the training point. So for example, if I want to upgrade the attack here, since Pickett has already a value of 1, he would have to roll 1 die. So I rolled a bone, which means that I cannot up his attack with this one training point. So I would have to spend the training point somewhere else. Similarly, to succeed in your defense training attempt, you must roll a number of defense dice that is equal to your current defense stat value. If you roll any bones during the attempt, you may re-roll those bones once. If you roll bones again after the re-roll, you fail the training attempt. Thus, you will have to spend that training point elsewhere. Otherwise, you succeed. So for example, if I want to up his defense value here, I would have to roll two defense die. So let's say I didn't roll any bones, then I would get to up his defense like this. However, if I rolled a bone like this, then I would get to re-roll this, this bone here leave this one here, but this one I re-roll. And if I roll a bone again like this, then I would have to spend that training point on a different stat or a different skill. Let's discuss about skills. This is Pickett's skill tree. This indicates what kind of skills Pickett has acquired. In the beginning, it'll always be empty, which means that Pickett does not have any skills. Each gear lock comes with a set of skill dice that are set aside but can be added to the skill tree once they're learned. Each skill die are numbered and each skills on the skill tree are numbered as well. So if you learn, for example, stand ground, then this number one will go in there like so. For skills, your training attempts will always succeed. However, some skills have prerequisite skills that need to be learned before acquiring it. If you look at the skill area here, there are skills with stars. 
like this. These skills can be learned without any prerequisites. However, there are skills that are being pointed by an arrow. Those skills can only be learned if the prerequisite skill has been acquired. For example, stand ground over here can be learned without any prerequisites since it has a star here. However, to learn shield form, you would have to have stand ground acquired in order to learn it. There are consumable dice in the skill area too as indicated here as the word consumable. These are different than skills. You cannot spend training points to acquire consumable dice. You can only acquire them through other means such as loot. It's important to note that skills become exhausted after use and exhausted dice become unexhausted after the encounter. In other words, once a skill is used, they cannot be used until the end of the encounter unless a different skill or different loot unexhausts them. So they will generally be used only once during an encounter. Another form of reward is loot. There are two types of loot rewards, loot and trove loot. Loot is indicated with a darker color like this while trove loot is indicated with a lighter color like this. Both loots can be drawn from the relevant loot piles. If you have loot as a reward, you can simply draw one from the loot pile and reveal it. Gear locks are limited to four loot per gear lock at any time. Some loot are single or multi-uses, while some loot are permanent. Single or multi-use loots get discarded after using all of them. Unless stated otherwise, loot can be used during your turn on a battle. If you have a trove loot as a reward, you can draw one, but you can't reveal it right away. You must go through a lockpicking attempts and unlock the loot before revealing it. You will get a lockpicking attempts during your recovery phase, which is right after the reward phase. Once all the rewards have been collected, you move to the final phase of the day, which is the recovery phase. During the recovery phase, you can do the following three actions. Lockpicking attempts, loot trading, which is essentially trading loot with others, but this would be useless during solo, and choosing an individual option among three options. Once your recovery phase ends, your day will end and you will start over at the new day phase. When you get a trove loot, you need to open it through lockpicking attempts during the recovery phase. Once you open it, you can reveal the trove loot and fully utilize it throughout your game. Every trove loot has three locks, lever, trip, and force. Each lock has a numerical value. The lever on this trove loot is four, trip is three, and force is two. You must attempt to unlock each lock one by one from left to right by rolling your lock picking dice. These are your lock picking dice. There is an initiative die and three action dice. The action dice will have different colors and lock types on their sides. The initiative die will alter or improve your action dice. You unlock a lock if your roll gives an equal or greater value of the lock type you are currently working on. Lever will be the first lock you will attempt to unlock for a fresh trove loot. So let's try rolling the lock picking dice. Okay, so you've rolled a 2L, a 2F, and 1L, and this symbol of the initiative die. In this case, 
the action dice themselves are not enough to reach four lever. You have two plus one, which is three, and you need four lever. However, the initiative die here is very helpful. This is the convert type. It treats a log type of one action die as the log type of your choice. So you can treat the 2F as a 2L by using the initiative die, making it in a total of 5L. So with the help of the initiative die, you can unlock the lever lock. If you unlock a lock, you have to exhaust the action dice you used to unlock it and you get to work on the next lock. So in this case, since you have used all of these action dice and therefore they get exhausted, you cannot move on to the next lock during this recovery phase because you don't have any action dice to roll. However, the initiative die is very interesting. So let's say that instead of the convert, I rolled this part. This side of the initiative die is called save plus one, and it gives an action die plus one, and you don't have to exhaust it if it was used on this lock. So for example, if I use save plus one on this one, it'll become 2L, and if I use it to unlock it, I won't have to exhaust this one. So two plus these two would be four, so I would only have to exhaust this and I can save this to try for a trip. So let's try going for the trip. So I rolled like this and we see the convert here again. I can convert the 3F to a 3T by using this. So I would actually be able to complete three trip. It's important to note that the initiative die never get exhausted. Any progress you made on the Trove Loot log picking attempts are saved. So you can pick up from next day where you left off. So let's say that I have unlocked the lever and trip, but failed to unlock the force. Then during my next recovery phase and during the log picking attempt phase, I can attempt to unlock the force. And if I do, I can reveal the trove loot. Usually I like to use the D6 die to indicate where I'm at in terms of the trove loot lock picking attempt progress. So if I am I have completed lever and trip, I usually like to put a two on top of it like this to indicate that I've completed up to trip and I only need force. If you need any help with lock picking, you can refer to this section over here titled The Art of Lock Picking in order to get some more detailed instructions. The next step of the recovery phase is to choose one of the individual options among three of them. First option is to rest and recover, which allows you to heal your HP to full. Second one is to search for a better loot. To do this, you must discard one loot, and then you have to roll six attack dice. For each bones you roll, you get to reveal a loot card. Then among them, you get to choose one. And this is some sort of a gamble because it is possible to roll no bones, in which case you simply end up discarding one loot. Let's say that I would like to discard this item over here. Then I get to roll six and I rolled three bones, which means I get to draw three additional oops, loot and then I would have to choose one and keep one. The final option is to scout the area. This option allows you to reveal the next baddie on your active baddie stack. A baddie stack is where you draw the next baddie for a battle. This stack would have been set up during the game setup. You will have to roll a d6 die. If you roll one to three, then you get to reveal a one point baddie. If you roll 
four to five, you get to reveal a five point baddie. And if you roll a six, you get to reveal a 20 point baddie. Let's say that I rolled a one. In this case, I get to reveal a one point baddie. And if it's a baddie that I would like to keep, I can leave it here or I can cycle it to the bottom of the stack like this. This marks the end of the recovery phase. And now you move on to the next day phase by going into the next day. To summarize briefly, during the new day phase, you move to the next day. And during the new encounter phase, you face an encounter that may involve fighting some enemies. If you successfully complete the encounter, then you move to the reward phase where you reap the rewards associated with the encounter and then move to the recovery phase. However, if you do not successfully complete it, then you skip the reward phase and go straight to the recovery phase. The recovery phase is the last phase of the day where you can heal your wounded gear lock, open some interesting loot, or have a quick peek of the next enemy you may face. In Too Many Bones, you must select exactly one Tyrant. Tyrant comes with a Tyrant card, a Tyrant encounter card, a Tyrant chip, and a Tyrant die. As explained earlier, the only way to win is twofold. First, you must progress through various encounters to face the Tyrant, and second, you must defeat the Tyrant by bringing their hit points down to zero. We have already discussed that you need a certain number of progress points in order to face the tyrant, and for Malmish, it's six. Once you have accumulated six or more progress points, during the encounter phase, instead of drawing a new encounter card, you can choose to face Malmish. As a reminder, you need to defeat the Tyrant within a certain number of days. The last day to defeat the Tyrant is indicated below the progress point value. So for Molmish, you have to defeat him on day nine or earlier. This Tyrant encounter card acts like any other encounter cards in your encounter deck. So it gets shuffled in to your encounter deck during setup. If you decide to face Molmish, you can flip the Tyrant card and follow the instructions in the back. You will have to battle the Tyrant and manage to defeat him in order to win the game. If you lose the battle, you can try again next day as long as the maximum number of days has not passed. The back of the Tyrant card will provide you with instructions on how to set up the battle mat, Tyrant skills, and the Tyrant die. You need to follow the instructions on the back of this Tyrant card to set up the battle mat. For the most part, the battle will be similar to any other battle encounter. It will obviously be more challenging as the tyrants are generally stronger than other baddies. Let's take a look at Molmish's chip as an example. As you can see, Molmish has 8 health and 6 initiative. He also has 2 attack. This small icon below the attack means that he has a specific tyrant die that gets rolled during his turn. His Tyrant die is explained on the back of his Tyrant card. He also has three skills, Frenzy 2, Retreat, and Shrouded. Of course, these are also included in the back of the Tyrant card. Finally, this footstep mark means that he can move diagonally as well as orthogonally. All these attributes make him a fearsome tyrant. If you can manage to beat Molmish by bringing his health down to zero, then you will win. The game offers different difficulty modes, the easiest being the adventure mode, which you get to start with plus two health, and you can have one training point before starting day one, and also, when you get KO'd during the adventure, the dice in your locked slots will remain. In the heroic mode, you add 1 HP, 
and also you gain one training point before starting day one. The legendary adventure mode is no training points or no HP boost during the start. Let's utilize everything that we've learned, so I'm going to do a very quick playthrough until day two. I hope that through this gameplay, you get a feel of how the game works. So let's start the game. So I'm going to play the adventure mode, which is the very easiest mode. Uh, that gives me two health points and I get one additional training point and I'm going to invest it in defense. So to do that, I roll two defense here, let's see, and I succeeded. So I get one more defense right here and we start on day one with the encounter phase. Only 12 hours till dawn and the send-off ceremony that will no doubt change the lives of every remaining gear lock and likely every life in Daylor. Weapons and supplies are ready to go, but the night is young and adrenaline fills the veins. It's clear no sleep will be had tonight. There's sure to be some shady peddlers in dark alleys ready to steal in loot. Then again, some last minute training could pay a nice dividend by morning. So what to do, what to do. First choice, squeeze in some last minute self-improvement, offers two training points. By the way, both are peaceful encounters. Shake down a shady peddler. Each gear lock in party may draw two loot and choose to keep one. So that's two training points or one training point plus one loot and both offer one progress point. So I'm gonna choose the, the training point option and I like to indicate my choice by putting this clear rock over here and two training points. So I'm going to attempt to upgrade my attack. There, that succeeded. And then I will get in one dexterity and I get one training point so I like to indicate it with this this one here I just put put it right there and I go on to the recovery phase during the recovery phase there I get the lock picking attempt but there's no trove loot so I skip that and I move on to oh and by the way, when I got two health, I should have got two health over here like this. Yeah, so I have seven health over here. And I get, I will scout the area. So I get to roll this one over here. Oh, oh let me roll it here. So it's a six. I can reveal a 20 point baddie but I'm going to reveal a one point baddie instead. So it's a clay golem, I'll keep it. And now we move on to day two, the encounter, hardly out the gate, 15 steps into the journey, 15 steps and already a gear lock boot is struck through by an arrow. Luckily, no toes were killed, Teeth are clenched and a painful tug is made while looking around in embarrassment. Yao, now sufficiently ticked, it's time to return the favor to the ominous figures at the edge of the woods. A commotion breaks out atop the city wall, interrupting all thoughts. Guards have now spotted the brazen intruders and are notching their arrows. Their help is at the ready. Like it or not, this adventure is underway. Both are battle encounters. Hail the guards for help. BQ, batty points. At the start of each round, arrows from the wall deal one true damage to each batty, recommended for first time adventurers. It's time to show Obender what gear locks are made of. With Obender's watching, you feel an extra shot of adrenaline as you prepare for an unass unassisted battle. BQ is batty points. After either choice, if battle is lost, place this encounter back on the top of your encounter deck. So this offers one training point, one train or one progress point, one training point, 
one loot, and depending on which choice, I get additional one training point. Now, 10 out of 10, I would always choose this, but as I'm going to pretend that I'm a first time adventurer, so I will choose the first one. So BQ is baddie points. So remember, BQ is equal so the baddie points is equal to the number of days times gear lock. So that's two. So we get one and two. The, this will be my baddie Q. And at the start of each round, arrows from the wall deal one true damage to a baddie. So I'm going to place this right here again. And let's set up the battle mat. So we have the bullfrog here. We have the clay golem here. And, okay, let's move that. And this one has four. This one gets one, two. Okay, five health like that. And both are melee, so they fit in this spot right here. And this one has an initiative value of 3. And this one has an initiative value of 2. And I get to roll my initiative, and I rolled a 2. Which means I go earlier than the golem. And I get to place my dude, and I'm going to place him over here. So I get to trigger my shield wall ability, which is at the start of the battle, roll your defense dice. So I'm going to do that. And wow, I rolled all bones, so that is not good. And at the start of the battle, there's another, another one here. It says... At the start of each round, arrows from the wall deal one true damage to each patty. So at the start of the round, we're starting now. So they both take one damage like this. And it's the bullfrog's turn. He targets me, deals two poison damage, or applies two poison on me. And it's my turn. And I have to resolve this. It's true damage, which means that defense would be useless against it. So I take two damage, and this goes down to one. And I'm going to target the bullfrog. And I'm rolling two attack, one defense. And I rolled two bones, a lot of bones this, this, this battle, and one damage. Like that. And it's the stone golem's turn. Stone golem will roll. Uh, he will actually come down first, and then he'll target me. And he dealt two damage. Wow. Okay. So I take two. Like that. So I'm in a little bit of a pickle here. So let's hope that I can defeat them. So it's going to be round two. And at the start of the round, both of them take one damage like so. And I am going to... No, no. So it's going to be the bullfrog's turn. It's going to target me and apply two poison like this. And it's my turn. I'm going to take two out like this. And this goes down to one. And I know that next turn he's going to die through this, um, through the round damage. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll one defense and two attack die and target this guy. Hopefully I, I get enough defense to defend against him and then uh, deal some damage against him. All right. 
So I rolled one bone, two attack, and one defense. So in this case, I can actually just finish him off. He only has three HP. So I get to do deal two damage. And this one gets exhausted because of the break ability. And I will uh, use two bones to perform shield bash, which means that I get to do this as damage. And I'll do it against him, which means he is dead. And now he's gone and it's round three and on round three because of the start of each round ability he takes one damage which means he died and i survived before he uh after he died i was still on the board with one health um so i win uh this encounter so Let's move on to the reward phase. That was a very close game. Wow. So the reward is that I get one progress point and one training point. And I will, I would like one more dexterity. And I get one loot. Let's see what loot we get. It's a raider armor. Once rolled on your defense die, dice may be upgraded to two defense. Bones rolled on your defense dice may be converted to one defense. Heavy. Wow. This is very interesting. So heavy means that this is considered three loot. Uh, in terms of my the ability to carry loot so recall that you can carry four loot but since this is heavy i'm this is considered having three three loot so i only have one more loot space here and of course this exhausted dice gets unexhausted and this obviously needs to come back and yeah, that's the end of the reward phase. And now we move to the recover, uh, the recovery phase. And I am go there's no lock picking here. And I'm going to choose to heal back up to full. Which allows me to get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven chips. And yeah, that's the end of round or day two. And now we move on to day three. So I'm just going to stop right here. That marks the end of day two. And congratulations. Now you know how to play Too Many Bones solo. Also, thank you so much for watching this video until the end. I really appreciate you hanging out with me. And um, Too Many Bones is definitely a game that caught me by surprise. And it's literally a game full of surprises. So I really hope that you find the game enjoyable too. If you have any questions about the game or if you noticed any mistakes that I've made throughout the video, please let me know in the comments below. And um, I hope you guys really enjoy Too Many Bones. Happy board gaming and see you next time.